So good to have you here. Thank you for worshiping. And now our chance to hear from God. Um, many of us and, and many, for many generations, when we experience tough things on earth, we think it's the end of the world. Big things like world wars and world pandemics, genocide, all kinds of natural disasters, the atomic bomb, the, not only the creation of, of the capacity of nuclear weapons, but actually using them. We've experienced a lot of this even in the last uh, few hundred years. And it's, it's common for people to think it's the end of the world, but it hasn't been. Life goes on. And yet, this morning, as we return to our study of the book of Revelation, we're in chapter 6, and we're looking with the Apostle John at the literal end of the world. This really is the end of the world, and you'll see it's completely different from anything we've ever experienced or even heard about. And God, for, for, for all reasons only he knows, has included this and a lot of space for this in his word. And so it's a joy to share uh, it with you, to lead you now into an experience of uh, God's judgment. Because the reason it brings up God's judgment is because when we look at the end of the world, we see it doesn't just wind down. It doesn't just wear out. God destroys the world. That's how it ends. We know that from the same word, the same Bible that tells us Jesus died for our sins and rose again on the third day. Clearly, over and over, we're told that the elements of our earth will melt with fervent heat, and it's described in vivid detail in the book of Revelation and many other places, that our world will end. And when it does, it'll be a result of God's judgment. Now, this is a huge subject in Scripture, much more than in the book of Revelation. I know for me, I read along in my Bible reading, and I, I'm not even to Genesis chapter 10, which is the first book in the Bible, and God's already flooded the world, destroyed the world by flood, except for Noah and his family. And then because of my Bible reading schedule, some of you may be doing this, where you don't just get to pick where you read, you're assigned to read it in a year. You have to read all the scary parts not just the parts that are encouraging that we tend to gravitate to. And so I'm finding myself in Isaiah and Jeremiah, which are like 66 chapters and 50 some chapters and lots of verses and very long on God's judgment, on the reality of God's judgment. A lot of sin, a lot of judgment, a lot of people's failing like us, like those of us in our generation and also lots of God's judgment. Whether it's built into the acts of sin and the degradation that comes immediately, or whether it's an outpouring of judgment like we're going to see when the world actually comes to an end. God's judgment's a huge subject, and as a Bible teacher, someone who's responsible to teach the Bible to you, it, I have to, we have to talk about that. Can't avoid it, can't hide in our head in the sand. We have to talk. Why would God want us to know about it so much? What, 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 what kind of effect is that supposed to have on us? Well, I'm going to introduce this subject today as we go into Revelation 6 through like 16, where the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are all poured out, blown, and, and, and opened. And, uh, but then next week, we'll circle back and we'll answer more typical questions, get a little more into the detail. Some of you are asking different questions, you know, are we here when this happens, different things like that. I'm going to have another shot at this, so... Take today as an introduction. We'll talk a lot about the verses, especially as we progress through the message. Um, but it's just an introduction. So we'll start right in. God's judgment. First thing I want to say about it is it's real. If you're taking notes, that's the first blank to fill in. God's judgment is real. Okay, Jesus was talking on the night before he was crucified to his disciples in the upper room and concerning the Holy Spirit that he was going to send as the helper. He said in John 16, verse 8, and he referring to the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay, what does that mean? That means if you are experiencing the Holy Spirit, beyond spiritual gifts or miracles, you're going to understand sin, righteousness, and judgment on a whole different level. He's gonna come and make it real. He's gonna come and show how it's not just some extreme religious teaching, but it's something that can change your life, something you should learn to appreciate about God is his judgment. So we pray that as we look at one of the most intense places in the Bible that, sh that shows God's judgment, that God's Holy Spirit will make it, make it real. He's not doing it to make us scared. He's, not doing, he's doing it for our good, 
for us to understand reality and live our life as we should, understand God, what he did for us when he saved us through his son, Jesus Christ. We have to know judgment is real. Now, a lot of people push back here, and, and us included. It's one of the reasons I haven't talked about it so much is I'm aware of the stereotype that it's preached in anger, it's preached extremely, and, and it's not liked by a lot of folks. It's not the most friendly thing if you're bringing a guest, if somebody's imagining church, hellfire and damnation church. People talk about it and they stereotype it just like that. It's one of them hellfire and damnation churches. And yet so much of the Bible, if we accept it, describes hellfire and damnation. And we need to learn to accept that. So people are like, I don't like that, Pastor. Did you have a bad week? Chill out. You know, not so gloom and doom. I mean, what is your problem? You should have a positive outlook and, and be happy and, and look positively on the future. And this is like making people paranoid and stuff like that. And here's the first quote I want to put on the screen. People, especially in our culture today, they want justice to be done on earth, but not in eternity. We don't get to choose. It will be done in eternity, not just here in our culture, in our society. And another one is they want men to behave justly toward men, but they don't want God to behave justly toward men. See, it should follow naturally if we're so big in our culture on justice between each other that we would allow God to be just with us. And, and so it just follows naturally that it comes up. People, you know, we've gotten so used to God's mercy that we're surprised when we see his judgment. But really, judgment is the normal thing. When people are sinning, failing, a world is messed up, it's crazy, what we should expect is God's judgment. And instead, we get the gospel, we get the grace of Jesus, we get God's mercy, and we've grown used to that. So when we hear now that there's even judgment at all that's true about God, we're shocked, we're surprised, because we're so used to his mercy. But make no mistake, his judgment is real. His judgment is real. And we really shouldn't care. In the end, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what any of us think about God's judgment because it's gonna happen, and when it happens, we won't have any control over it. We won't have any choice in the matter. We don't get to vote on whether God's judgment is real or not. Okay, this isn't, this isn't one of those times where what the majority thinks will even matter, because it's not in the majority's hands or their power to control. It comes from God, it's revealed in his word. If we believe God's word is truth, then we must accept that God's judgment is real. Believe me, it's not just in the book of Revelation. It's all through. Not just in the Old Testament, obviously, this is the end of the New Testament. All sorts of stereotypes that try to categorize God's wrath and not accept it as, as being real. But this is the first thing I wanna tell you. Let the Holy Spirit make it real to you, even as we look at it together, okay? Second point is God's judgment is praiseworthy. Not only is it real, but we can actually praise God for it. Now, I've never heard this in a worship song. I've been in church all my life. Maybe you have. Have you heard anybody ever say in a worship prayer time or worship lyrics, God, we praise you for your wrath. No, we really worship you. We admire you today that you are a God of judgment and anger and that one day you'll pour it out on the earth and the music swells and we're all blessed and we appreciate God more and we're changed forever because of that appreciation of God's character. Okay, I wanna tell you today, it's true of God. God is impressive, God is praiseworthy, God is admirable, so that attribute of God is also praiseworthy, admirable. We just have the wrong view of it. We have a, a, a bad view, a skewed view, because if we're seeing it and understanding it, we would admire God for it. And if it's not something you like to think about and you've avoided it, pushed it out of your mind, I'm not even sure how you would defend it to somebody if they were to ask you, do you really believe in a God of judgment that he will destroy the world? If that's true, you're, you're just not understanding something that you could more fully appreciate about God and worship him more, admire him more, understand your life better, look forward to the future more. Be able to, to deal with reality as we face it in the news and in our society, even here locally, when we see so much going on. We need to appreciate the judgment of God. Stop seeing it negatively. It's a praiseworthy attribute of God. 
we can praise God for his wrath. Now, the Bible does in Psalms and in Revelation when it goes to these praise doxologies, and here's one of them from Revelation 19. Look at these verses, verses one through three. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Why? For his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Do you hear that on local radio? Do you hear a worship song like that? We're missing because they're worshiping God for his wrath in the Bible. And especially as the world ends, we're missing something we could be appreciating. We're, we're missing a piece of the puzzle and it's not going together and we're deficient as a result. The, the judgment of God is actually praiseworthy. Now, you know, it's kind of a scary thing because we know we deserve it, right? And I'll be honest, we're all sinners and if we understand it correctly, then we deserve that judgment. So we're a little skittish. It's kind of like an extremely flammable object being told to praise fire. It's like, I worship you, I know I deserve that. And if it weren't for Jesus, I would be experiencing that, dreading that. So I'm, I'm a little skittish because it's only by the grace of Jesus that I'm not, you know, experiencing the dark side of that. And so we're just a little scared. And as a result, we don't fully appreciate God and what he did for us through Jesus because that's what Jesus took for us. We don't know the good news of the gospel because we don't know the bad news. And we've forgotten that that judgment is even real. And one day it will be poured out and people will be terrified. And we're saved because of Jesus. And this is something that is praiseworthy. The next thing, God's judgment, it's not only real and praiseworthy, God's judgment is aggressive. This is just the way I see it as I'm looking at the verses, I'm seeing God being aggressive for our good. He's being the aggressive leader, taking the initiative finally, and doing what he does to judge the world for our good. All right, so... I'm reminded of a story. I first got married. We moved to Dallas, away from both families. Lived all alone. I was just 22. I had just turned 22. And uh, one day, Lynn was working as a nurse. I was a seminary student. One day, Lynn gets real sick. We're in a little one-bedroom apartment right downtown Dallas. And I don't know what to do. She's the nurse. She's so sick, she can't even think straight. She's throwing up. She's got a high fever. She's not getting better. She's not getting over it. After about a day, a day and a half, I take her to the, to the emergency room. They send us home with a shot of Demerol. Now she's just sleeping. I keep checking on her. She's not any better. She's getting worse. So I eventually take her up to the hospital where she works, the Dallas Med Surge Clinic. And all the nurses that knew her it was the middle of the night. They all came around her. They were all scared, all worried, because they knew that she had been admitted with the diagnosis of toxic shock syndrome. And of course, that's a very deadly condition for, for young women. Well, what stays in my mind from that night ever since is the attending physician whose name was Dr. Bowden. He was a doctor that was extremely, I, I, how can I communicate? He was extremely competent, except to say the nurses all liked him, which is very unusual for a doctor. <laughs> all the nurses on the floor loved this doctor. He delivered our first child a, a year, two years later. And I'll never forget him that night. He looked at me in the middle of that crisis. Here, I'm just a kid. And he said, we're going to have to watch Lynn real close tonight. We may have to be very aggressive. And I didn't know what he meant. I didn't understand it. I was scared. But all I knew was she was in my care. I didn't know what to do. And finally, he's taking care of my wife, and he's willing to be aggressive if needed to save her life. And I was like, I like you, doctor. <laughs> I'm real glad you're here and my wife's with you and I respect your strength to whatever you have to do to save her. And that's the way we can be with God because he can't make a new earth till he destroys the old one. And, and the key statement we'll put on the screen, there would be no happily ever after for us to enjoy if it weren't for God's judgment. And everything that we see him do, he's doing it for the good of those who know him, who believe in him, who have received his free offer of his, the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, the lamb. So wonderful to us, so scary in the book of Revelation. God's judgment is his aggressive action, is his aggressive action for our good. Could we respect someone 
who wasn't that way? You know, if somebody tells you they don't believe in a God of judgment, you, you look at the world and you say, really, can you respect a God who isn't angry? Would you respect a leader, a parent, when they say they love the folks they're, they're responsible for, and that kind of stuff's going on, and they're not mad? You know, there's always that, that respect. I don't know. I don't see it. I don't want to go there, but it, they would go there if I went, did this, did that. I'm going to see that come out of them. You do not want to see that. That's something we respect. And would we respect God if he was indifferent, if he was apathetic, if he was too weak to do anything about it? Well, all of that isn't true. God is aggressive. He's aggressive. He's confident. He is leading a world that's just gone wild, a world that's ready to be destroyed finally after thousands of years. Well, God's judgment is real, it's praiseworthy, it's aggressive, but it's also passionate. Just a brief touch on this point. God's showing his um, hatred for sin. And I was reading it this week and I'm thinking, wow, this is how he feels about the sin that tempts me. The sin that tempts all of us, that, that looks so normal and, and it's attractive and we want to, you know, kind of flirt with it and build a bridge to it. And God's like, look down into the future and see what I do to that. And therefore, what I feel about that right now, therefore, what it's really like right now. You want to know its true nature? Because it's got you under its spell. Let me tell you the truth about sin before it deceives you. God says, I hate it. Look at how I treat it in the end. And you'll understand how I feel about it right now. And so this is the key statement. We pray and ask God to give us his hate for the sins that we love. Do you love something God hates that you see that one day he'll destroy? And he showed you that in his word. Then just simply ask him. Just be honest and say, God, what is wrong with me? I love the stuff that's going to be destroyed one day and it's going to be the reason you destroy the world. Help me to have your hate stronger than my love for this sin. And you're showing me what it's really like. God was passionate. He was showing his hate for those things that were tearing his world down and his people down. And uh, we, we need to pray that he'll give us that same, that same hate. It's like, why is it so horrible? Why is God so angry? <laughs> what's going on? And he's like, you're so confused because you have no idea what sin is like. It's like, where is all this, this emotion and anger and wrath coming from? Well, who knows? It must be sin. It must be that sin deserves death. It must be that we have a wrong view of the things that God says are wrong, that they really are bad. And there's actually judgment already built in in the degradation of our experience with sin. And so we just need to get that passion. And I like to think of it this way. God, you're going to destroy evil one day like whole nations that are evil. I want you, the same God, to destroy the strongholds of evil in my life right now. Same power that you're going to use to destroy evil finally. Cast it into the lake of fire. Break it like an iron scepter breaking a pottery dish. Do that in my life right now and set me free. I want more than your forgiveness. <laughs> I want to be free. Destroy evil in my life right now. I'm not waiting for the apocalypse. Same God, same hate. Through the Holy Spirit, that's one of the things he can do when he convicts you of judgment, sin, righteousness. He's like, I'll help you hate it. See it like it really is, what it's doing to you. You can destroy it now. God will destroy it now. Same power. God's judgment is also, and this is where we start getting now more into the text, more into the verses specifically, God's judgment is prepared. You look at the, the account of God's judgments unlike any other in the Bible. It's organized, it's planned, it's prepared, even choreographed with the angels and other uh, things happening. It's not just like, okay, all of a sudden fire and sulfur falls from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah because these angels come and call it down from heaven. It's not like, you know, all of a sudden even the springs of the earth and the rain and all it just floods and drowns the earth like in Genesis 6 through 10. This is different. This has been prepared for thousands of years orchestrate. It's more like a symphony than a random disaster. There's actually 21 different phases at least because there's seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And each one is a significant thing that happens in the judgment of God. 
And my point is, God has had a long time to prepare it because he's been holding it back for thousands of years. And this is one of the crucial ways that his anger is not like ours. Here's the key statement here. God's anger is not like ours, which is why we hate it. We project our view of human anger onto God. Even our view of angry preachers, fighting fundamental churches, project that or whatever. He's had a bad day. He's really given you a lot of his frustration in that sermon. I don't care what it is. We don't like it. And then we project that on to God. But here's one of the key ways God's anger is different. He doesn't react quickly. Like we would respect in due process, like we would respect in our court system, it's well thought out, it's documented, and perfect justice is being carried out when it's finally unleashed. Thousands of years have gone into the preparation, and when it happens, it's extremely choreographed, coordinated, more like a symphony than a random disaster. You know, when I'm angry so often, I'll be honest, my blood leaves my brain and goes to my arms and my legs, fight or flight. And so when I'm angry, I'm stupid. Anybody else out there has this problem? And afterwards, I'm always apologizing and sorry I said or did anything in that anger. And so are the people who experience it. Very sorry that they experience it. And they are not praising me. They are not admiring me for my anger. They're like, you got mad, you got stupid. All the blood left your brain, and we all know what that is. That has never happened with God. God is not quick to anger. He is slow to anger. He is slow to anger. He's never unleashed his wrath as an impulse, a reaction for which he would apologize later. He's never had to apologize today. He's never lost his temper. <laughs> Again, let me stretch your, your mind to begin to admire this wrath that's held back. Think of it this way. God sees everything. Here's a good verse for it. Hebrews 4, 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I always heard that verse growing up. Made me feel guilty. Like, oh, God sees everything. There's no secrets in heaven. Da, da, da. Makes me feel guilty. But think of it from God's perspective. What did he see last night in the world? 7.9 billion people sinning. How much murder did he watch? How much sexual abuse did he observe? How many people were kidnapped, were enslaved? How much stealing and lying and greed and ungratefulness, whatever makes you mad that you know goes on in the world, God has watched it and he sees it. And do you think he's not mad? He's more sensitized to it than we are. He's perfectly holy. He's more offended. He's more loving. So... He cares more about the people who are being hurt way more than we ever would. And we mistake the fact that he's patient, that he's forbearing, that he holds back his anger. We mistake and think he's condoning it. He's fine with it. There's no problem with it. I guess God's just sort of given up and it's not really wrong. Make no mistake. That anger has been building for thousands of years that he alone has experienced from seeing every sin committed every moment on earth by billions of people. So when that dam finally breaks, what do you expect that wrath to be like? I would expect it to destroy the world. Right. And that's exactly what it does. But it doesn't do it as an impulse. It doesn't do it as a reaction. And God's apologizing. I'm sorry, I just lost my temper. No, it comes out and it's choreographed. It's involving the angels and this organized and it's prepared and it's been thought through and it's perfectly just due process. And, and, and so it's not like our anger not like our anger. It's prepared. God's judgment is prepared. Now, we keep going here, and I'm going to try to be calm here, but th these get a little more passionate because more of the verses I read this week come out. God's judgment is also devastating. I don't know if you believe the Bible, but if you believe the Bible and you read, and I encourage you to read Revelation 6 through 16, even for next week, because we'll talk again about that passage the seals, the bowls, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, and the different specifics of things that happen. But one of the things you'll step back and you'll go, oh my goodness, God's judgment is devastating. If you thought COVID was bad, if you thought the Holocaust is bad, if you thought the world wars, genocide, the worst things that you can imagine in history, 
are bad? Wait till you read. When the fourth seal is opened, the pale horse appears with the rider named Death. And a fourth of the earth, a fourth of the earth is killed by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. And if that happened today, that would mean two billion people would die. Two billion people. When the sixth seal was opened, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black. The moon turned blood red. Stars stars began to fall to the earth like figs falling from a tree. And the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. Now, can you picture that happening? How would that be reported on the news? There would be no more news, no more worldwide internet, no more worldwide communication. This truly is the end of the world. And it's completely devastating. You know, it's interesting with COVID, no matter what you think of it, you can see how quickly a little microscopic organism can bring the whole world to a standstill. I watched a movie last night. It was made 10 years ago. It really portrays the glamour of the world and the cities. And, you know, it just seems like it's so big and so shiny and attractive and oh my gosh so strong and powerful and and one little microorganism and we're all wearing masks and we're not going to the mall and we're not gathering and we're not getting closer than see even if you disagree with that how easy would it be for God who is the creator and the sustainer of this world to just stop holding the protons and the nucleus of the molecules and those positive forces begin to repel and everything disintegrates It is not hard for him at all. And so all I'm saying is, don't look at this world and think it's invulnerable. Don't look at people and think we're just so strong and tough. Oh, just like that. We're gasping, just like that. Everything's falling apart. It won't be hard. And everything as we see it that looks so good, looks so wonderful, is got an end. It's like a building with a condemned sign on it. Don't move in. Don't invest your life, your hope, your thoughts, your dreams in this world. It's like a cosmic game of Monopoly and God just puts the board back in the box. It doesn't matter who had the most money, who had the most property because it all comes to an end. And Jesus said, that's why you should store up your treasure in heaven, not on earth. Because he knew that this day was coming, that our world will end in a way that's devastating. So the key statement here, however attractive the world might seem at times, there is no future in it. However attractive the world might seem at times, there is no future in it. So we go on, God's judgment is not just devastating, God's judgment is terrifying. John didn't just like, eat something and then have a really weird dream and write it in the Bible. He was caught up into heaven through the spirit, given a heavenly vision and the vision of the future and told to write it in God's holy word, inspired by God's spirit, the way we know truth just as much as Jesus died for our sins and rose again from the grave on the third day. This isn't another apocalyptic gloom and doom movie showing somebody's negative view of the future. Well, here's another take that's pretty dark. Now, this is... Biblical prophecy, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. What we're reading is going to happen. And as I continue to read, and you read with me, and we, we live in this, and the Holy Spirit makes it real to us, listen to these verses. Revelation 6, verse 15. Look at these strong, successful people. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? The same one we just worshiped is gonna be so terrifying. I don't know about you, but does that, that adds to my respect. I don't know how many people chose to come to church all over the world today and to church. I don't care. They don't get to vote. Whatever they think of the lamb, one day they will be terrified of him. And we would too, but for the grace of God, 
That's us. The Jesus we worship is not some sweet little Jesus. Children come sit on his lap and there's just some who wouldn't hurt a flea. One day they will tremble in fear at the wrath of the Lamb. That's our sweet Jesus and the one who sits on the throne, our heavenly Father. So familiar, so frightening. And I looked and I realized they're not even fearing death. They want to die. They're crying out for death. Come on, rocks. Come on, mountains. Crush us, please. Anything. Revelation 9 verse 6 says, During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. So we must say this is a fear worse than death. A fear of our God. Of the Lamb of Jesus. And these are the folks who have mocked God, who've killed Christians. These are the folks who were successful, so intimidating, and now everything's changed. God's flipping the world right side up, and the first shall be last, and the last shall be first, and everything is, com is completed. In a moment, it's changing, and they know it. They know it, and they're losing confidence. And all that brazenness and that rebellion and that hatred and that, that superior look in their face, like they know what they're talking about, changes to total terror in a moment. Why do you need to see that? You need to see that because if somebody's persecuting you, don't try to get even with them. Just think about this scene. If somebody's mocking you, don't be intimidated. Just realize that one day, they're gonna have this expression. If they think Jesus is a, is a cuss word, he's a joke, he's a crutch for the weak, the opiate of the masses, whatever, God is dead, all this stuff they keep coming out with, sounds so good, everybody's clapping and everything else, just like, don't be intimidated. Jesus can defend himself. And the one who sits on the throne, when the time comes, will change their expression to total terror, a fear that they will say, I wish I could die and not have to face the Lord Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when Hitler took his life in that bunker, he didn't get out of his judgment, did he? His big problem wasn't the allies and what they were going to do to him if they caught him. His big problem is he's going to stand before the Lord Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, an answer for every death he caused during the Holocaust. Adolf Hitler did not escape the judgment of God when he took his life. Neither did the terrorists who hijacked the four planes on 9-11. When they took their lives, they didn't get out of the real fear, and that's being held accountable for all the lives they killed. Listen, no one can escape the wrath of God. That's what we see. You believe the Bible, then you see that, and it's, it's terrifying. And, and I'm not up here to try to use that to scare you. No, it's in the Scripture. You can read it. How else do you read those verses? Why does God put that in the Word? Because we're supposed to see that. We're supposed to be, like, grateful. Thank you. That's what you saved me from, Jesus, that I don't have that dark side of you. I'm not under that wrath of the Lamb, but instead the love, the gentleness, the sweetness that I enjoy, that I've enjoyed in my life. But listen, that other is still there. That other side of Jesus is still there. He could take care of himself, worship him and respect him. His wrath will terrify most people in the world when it comes to an end. It's terrifying. You know, we're more comfortable talking about what we're saved to. I'll be honest and confess to this. As a minister, I like to talk about the gospel and I like to say nice things. So I'll say, hey, it's so great that the gospel saves us to a new relationship with God and to, you know, a wonderful, abundant life. And, and isn't it wonderful? It saves us to eternal life in heaven. And, and we paint the picture. And these things are true and they're wonderful. But sometimes we fail to be as comfortable to say, what are we saved from? Not just what are we saved to. We are saved from the wrath of God for all eternity, the final judgment of God. And what we'll see in the weeks to come is the truth, it's the scripture. And we see it all through our life, people die, 
People experience horrible things in our world. And so much of it is the judgment just built into the acts themselves. Just the crazy world. It's just, it's not even, it's not even anybody's fault. It's just this chaos in the world. Listen, that's judgment. In so many different forms. And if you even talk about it today, it's like, oh, what's your problem? You saying God's judging me? What else? It's like, so what? I mean, I don't care. They, they, they hated the prophets. They always have. And they're the ones who keep talking about judgment. Say, oh, you, we don't need to hear that. And it comes. And we see it comes. Where is Babylon? Where is Medo-Persia? Where is Greece? Where is Rome? All gone. Experienced a judgment they never believed until it came to them. And all of them had prophets telling them. It's a terrifying thing. I want to say just before we go on to the, the people who most appreciate what I just said are the people who have suffered the most in this world. And that's not our culture. Some people have suffered for their faith, sure. But much more so in cultures with weaker governments, more violence, where people are able to do whatever they want and they come and they kill your whole family right in front of you because you're Christian. Do you know that's happening? Do you know our brothers and sisters are being killed? Do you know there's genocide taking place all because of, of, a, of our faith? And do you know that when they see that and they experience that, it helps them so much versus like this concept like to never get preached? Because, oh, we don't want to talk about a heavy judgment. <laughs> and then we try to take God's place and we're horrible at it. We perpetuate violence. Key statement, believing in God's judgment doesn't make us more violent. It makes us less violent because we leave vengeance and justice to him. And the people who most appreciate this are the ones who've experienced injustice and they just trust God. Ultimately, no one gets away with it. Ultimately, for all eternity. And if you see someone who's intimidating or hurting you, your ultimate reaction, if you believe in the Holy Spirit ministers this to you, is gonna be to pity them. Not be intimidated, not hit back. Pity them. Because this is what's gonna happen to them. Barring a miracle of God, an intervention of God's grace. This is what they're gonna experience. Well, then it goes to God's judgment is dark. And, and I saw this this week. You might think that, you know, once the stars start falling to the earth, once millions and billions of people start dying, that maybe somebody will have a little camp meeting and come to Jesus. We think maybe somebody will, will start believing and go to church. Somebody will think, man, I don't know, is there something else from the Lamb besides wrath? Was there some kind of deal where we get forgiveness with like those millions of other people that are up there in heaven? How do we get in heaven? How do we get out of this wrath? None of that. None of that's being said because it was so dark. They can't see. The heart is so stubborn, the sinful heart, the, the resilience of sin. You know, literally the earth is falling apart around them and they're still sinning. After six trumpets were blown, it says in Revelation 9 verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, which took billions of people, still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. People are worshiping demons until a minute before the demons are consigned to hell cast into the lake of fire, bound up in judgment. And a split second before, there's people still worshiping them. Earth's falling apart all around them. And they're plowing ahead with their sexual immorality and their thefts and their magic arts and their murder. Do you see the hardness of heart? Because I'm just saying, if that's not you, if that's not me, we should thank God. Because if it weren't for the grace of God, we'd be just as blind, just as dark, just as foolish. And I begin to think, 
what really changes the heart? Man, if you can hear me, if this is more than a sermon to you, if you believe revelation, if this is your faith, if, if this is your God and the Holy Spirit's working in you, do you know that you are experiencing something more powerful than a meteor? Meteors are slamming into the earth, but they can't change those hard hearts. No way. And then how could we ever think we could with a sermon or nagging? And this is the key statement here. If the events of the apocalypse aren't strong enough to break through a hard heart, then certainly we can't through arguing, nagging, lectures, sermons, whatever. And so we sit back and we go, why do I believe? Why am I on the good side of the lamb? Why have I experienced salvation from this kind of horrible judgment? It must be something more powerful than the end of the world. Because the end of the world ain't saving people. And it's because of the light. It's because of the light and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God who shines into our hearts. And it's more powerful, it's more wonderful than a natural disaster. If you can believe, if you can see it, if you receive it today, if you say, thank you, Jesus, I need you, I'm a sinner, I'm not gonna continue, I repent, I turn to you, help me, make me one of your children, save me from your judgment. If that happens for you, you have a miracle more dramatic than the apocalypse. And, and, and it's because it's not dark. You can see by God's light. And that just makes me so grateful. People think, oh, we think we're better than everyone else. Or this comes across as self-righteous. Are you kidding me? We're all sinners. That would be us if it were not for the grace of God. It's just so dark. I've heard that's true in world wars, great catastrophes. Sometimes people turn around and, and that doesn't even last. And most of the time they don't. They get even more sinful. All the books I read about the world wars, their people weren't all turning around. Well, I wanna lead us in communion now. This last point is God's judgment is loving. It's actually the flip side of his love. His anger is there in proportion to the amount of his love for the for those of us who are experiencing all this sin and pain. There was a man who was known to be very kind and gentle and he got married when he was older and he had a daughter, looked so much like the woman he loved, his wife. And one day the little girl was taken out. She was abused, she was killed by a, a kidnapper. And they caught the man and they brought the father down to the station to press charges. And this man who normally was very gentle and kind and upstanding, respected in the community, when he saw the man who did that to his little girl, it took four police officers to hold him back. And we understand that. The greater the love, the greater the wrath toward that which is harming the love object. So God says, I love you, I love you. No, I love you so much. We should expect a great deal of wrath. And, and, and we have that. And in fact, we can't understand communion. We can't understand what Jesus did. The cross of Jesus just slumps over into our question mark. If there's no judgment of man, why did Jesus die? Why did he have to die? Something so horrible have to take place, except for the fact that he was actually taking the judgment that we deserve, that there is judgment and he took it for us, as horrible as it was. And this represents that, his body hanging on the cross his blood shed on the cross for us, separated from his father, all because of our sin. That was the judgment of God. He took that for us. And so with communion, we just make that personal. We just say, well, I knew that and I remembered that and I believe that. And so I, I receive that for me. I, that's not just a thing. That is my story. Jesus, you died for me. I'm a sinner. I deserve that kind of judgment. Thank you. I, I needed it. Thank you for dying for me. Please forgive me and save me from ultimate judgment. That's what we remember and picture through communion. So if you want to take the element there, Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, he said, this is my body, which is for all of you. Do this as often as you eat it to remember me.
the picture continued to his blood, his, his life given. He said, this is my blood. Uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we, we believe in you. We receive you now. Thank you through your spirit. Make yourself real. Thank you for your word that tells us the truth, the truth about sin, the future, the end of our world, the judgment that you bring, why it's admirable, why we can praise you, not to have to avoid it, stick our head in the sand, Lord. We, we worship you, even that you're gonna be so scary one day. We respect you for that, that you would be so gentle and loving. We realize we don't deserve that. And just to be on that side of you, wow. Give us your hate for sin. Through your power, destroy sin in our life. The strongholds, the habits, the worldliness. <clears throat> That's keeping us from being alive and effective and lights in, in a dark world. Lord, help us to leave vengeance to you and <clears throat> not be intimidated. Give us your holy confidence. Lord, don't let us make our home here. Don't let us be attracted to a world that's so definitely gonna be condemned, destroyed. And Lord, through the miracle of your spirit, I pray stronger than any event in the apocalypse that you would use us to see others come to faith and that we ourselves would, would praise you for the miracle of our own faith. But I pray you, the lamb, would shine, would reveal, would forgive long before you judge. Thank you for your patience. Despite all the sin that you see, we do worship you, Lord. We, we praise you for your judgment, your wrath, your anger. It is righteous. It is justified. It is admirable. And we look now to this praise uh, that can only be at a moment like this in the book of Revelation. You are worthy. You are the lamb. And bless us even now as we sing, as we, as we join that doxology from the book of Revelation now as we end our service. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray, the lamb who was slain. Amen.